Dr. Brown, Mr. Grayson for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let's assume, gentlemen, that you wanted to create hard, fast, clear rules against institutions that pose systemic risk and would require a government bailout. Let's assume that you were the ones deciding what those rules should be or what they would be. And let's assume that you did not want to leave it up to the wisdom or lack thereof of a particular person put in the position of judging systemic risk. What rules would you establish? Let's start with Dr. Baker. Well, I don't know if I can give you an exact set of rules. I mean, size would certainly be a factor, but again, uh, deferring to the comments made by, by both Dr. Johnson and Dr. Simon early, Sachs earlier, um, those would not be the only, uh, that would not be the only factor. But I, I really don't know that you could get around the judgment of the particular regulators. I mean, I think the, basically at the end of the day, you would have to say, can the FDIC deal with this institution? And again, we've had the issue raised about resolution authority, and I think it would be desirable for for the regulators to have resolution authority in the event of a bank holding company needing a, a major bank with a large bank holding company with large operations apart from the bank. I think that would certainly be desirable. I don't think that's absolutely essential, by the way. I think it's been striking how the government has been very effective in steering the course, say, with Chrysler and General Motors, even though it obviously has no resolution authority of the sort that it would with a bank. So I think it would be desirable to see Congress uh, pass legislation like that, but I don't think that should be used as an excuse for not having dealt with Citigroup or some of the other banks that may actually be insolvent. Dr. Johnson, what rules would you establish? I, I, I would uh, pick up on a point that was uh, just beginning to emerge in the exchange between Dr. John and, Do and Dr. Brown a, a moment ago, which is I think you need banks to operate much more like utilities, as they did in the 1950s and 60s. And I think you need a risk-taking part of the financial system, but it shouldn't be the banking system. If I, if I look at these great uh, paintings that you have along the wall here, they're reminding me of the era of, of innovation and breakthrough technologies we had after World War II, driven largely by private sector, a lot of private sector innovation as well as sensible use of, of public money, in a system where, the, at a time when the banking system was very tightly regulated in terms of the banks that made payments, the banks that took deposits, and there was a separation of the payments part of the, the economy, the part that, that, you know, if that collapses, we've got a very big problem, and the very simple credit-making part of the economy, including the very positive role of a lot of s smaller banks that were also part of this regulatory structure, with the risk-taking venture capital, new venture creation part of the, of, of the economy. I'm a professor of entrepreneurship at MIT. No one could be more pro-entrepreneur than, than, than I am, and I think that's completely consistent with keeping the, the rest of the bank system much more tightly contained. Go back to the 1950s and 60s in terms of bank regulation. Dr. Sachs, what substantive rules would you establish to simply prevent institutions from reaching the point where they pose systemic risk? I believe that at the core, even though we have a commercial banking crisis, that this was a shadow banking crisis that uh, it was the essence of this. And as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, the four elements of proper banking regulation uh, that have protected us from a massive uh, commercial banking run and crisis for decades are uh, deposit insurance, strong regulation over capital adequacy, uh, lender of last resort facilities, and a mechanism for resolution. We lacked all of that with Wall Street, all of that. That led to a bubble in the housing sector and in other sectors that brought the whole economy uh, into this upturn and then uh, massive downturn. And we still apparently lack uh, clear legal structures for resolution of bank holding companies. So I believe that we have the makings, though not being properly used right now, for the strict commercial banking sector. We do not have a regulatory system around the near banking sector, which is a big failure. We do not have a clear resolution mechanism for the uh, bank holding company structures like Citigroup or Bank of America, and we need it for that. I do not believe personally that if we need to intervene in Bank of America or Citigroup, if that turns out to be the outcome, that that's going to be a calamity per se I think we have structures that can do that with respect to the commercial bank components of those even big institutions. I don't regard that as beyond what we have. I think we're throwing a lot of arbitrary things into this situation right now uh, in a way out of uh, reaction to a panic that was set off by mistakes in the shadow banking sector last 
fall with the failure of Lehman. Dr. Baker, uh, how do you know when an institution is too big to fail? Well, again, this is, thank you. That will inevitably be a judgment call, but I mean, basically the question here, it's... Is, uh, is that inevitable? Is it really inevitable that it's a judgment call? Well, let me put it this way. Um, the judgment call we had uh, the opportunity to see back in, in the fall when uh, Treasury Secretary Paulson and Federal Reserve Board Chair Bernanke and uh, uh, Timothy Geithner at the New York Fed made the decision that uh, Lehman Brothers was, was not too big to fail and that ended up being, I think, wrong, at least in the sense that they needed to have some sort of orderly, um, orderly process, orderly resolution, which clearly was not put in place. Um, could you have known in advance? Perhaps, um, but clearly they made a very big mistake. So I'm a little, um, I, I certainly have been very critical of all three of those gentlemen, but, you know, I do respect their, their intelligence and say, you know, I think they, they had much more data than I did and they still made a very big mistake. So I don't think you could have a simple formula that will always tell you that, you know, this bank is too big to fail or this bank is not. Uh, you should war game it. One of the things that regulators don't do enough, and the International Monetary Fund does a little bit, but also not enough, is, is, is play out scenarios where you have you know, massive shocks of the kind that are you know, not in your briefing memos, but this is really what happens in, 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 in the actual world. And you should see what happened. If you should go through exactly how you're going to deal with particular banks failing. And, and if you feel you can't intervene under certain, certain circumstances in a particular bank because it's too scary, that bank's too big to fail. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This has been an excellent hearing from my perspective, and I really am glad that we conducted it. Thank you, Mr. Grayson. Mr. Bill Bright for